Good morning. I'm your host, Claudia Shamba, welcoming you to the October 24, 2023 edition of Ask a Leader. Today, returning to the show this time together are Ara Epkarian and Kev Abizajian with a lot on their minds with the geopolitics that are taking place starting on campus and extending worldwide. Yes, sir, we're going to chew on all those rather sizable bites. From two University of California chancellors weighing in on international catastrophes, then consider the remarkable gesture of the recent visit a former member of the Turkish parliament, Garo Paylan, whose laps around Southern California this month included one right here in Irvine. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the show. Returning to Ask a Leader are my guests, Dr. Ara Apkarian, Distinguished Professor of Chemistry, and Dr. Kev Abazajian, Professor of Physics and Astronomy and the Director of the Center for Cosmology at UCI. As both physical science academics and highly involved members are descendants of the Armenian diaspora, they have a lot of jobs with the geopolitics taking place. From the campus to the Caucasus, we'll take up a tale of two university California chancellors weighing in on international catastrophes, then on to the recent visit here in Irvine by former member of the Turkish National Assembly, Garo Palan. Mr. Palan has been speaking about levers within the grasp of Armenians around the world. This program will consider his points as well as his broader audience amidst the staggering incidences of genocide globally. A brief introduction of my two returning guests, Ara Apkarian's work combines experiment and theory on a wide range of topics ranging from photophysics, low temperature chemistry and physics, condensed phase photodynamics. R is a fellow of the APS and a a AAAS, I didn't fill in those, those acronyms, a foreign member of the National Academy of Sciences of Armenia and has been recognized with awards in teaching, service, and research. Kev Abazajian is UCI astrophysicist and director of the Center for Cosmology here at UCI. His work includes studying the origin, structure, and composition of the universe and the fundamental physics governing it. Kev serves on the Cal State University UC Calbridge undergraduate program, the UC Irvine Council on Faculty Welfare, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the Friend of Science Network, the Union of Concerned Scientists, the Armenian National Committee of America, the American Assembly of America, the American Astronomical Society, and the American Physical Society. But this program is not about physical science. No, we're getting right between nanoparticles and the cosmos. In the middle is Armenia. They both joined me in studio. Welcome back to Ask a Leader, Ara Apkarian and Kev Abazajian. Thank you, Claudia, for having us. Okay, Ara, that's Ara. Let's see if Kev is going to pick up on this mic. Am I here? Yes, you're there. So before we get into the political material, I'd like to begin with the personal. And I'd, I'd like to have you two trace where each of your forebears were last in Armenia. And then I, I want to see if I can trace where you as individuals are. So I think our, our, I, your ancestors were back from 1915. My grandparents were the survivors of the genocide. Uh, they walked the desert and my grandmother survived and arrived in Syria where our family started. And so, and then we trace you. So for people to understand, Ara then was a resident of Aleppo, Beirut, Los Angeles, Evanston, and then Irvine. Is that correct? I've got the spots. Now, Kev, your forebears left the USSR Republic of Armenia in the 1950s. Is that, do I have that part right? 
Uh, no, I left. You, that's right, you did leave. The Republic of Armenia when I was five years old with my parents. In the 1970s? Yep. Okay. Then, the, you, you left then, and then you were, went from there to, to Houston, San Diego, New Mexico, Maryland, and then Irvine. Yep. So people have that. Now, I, I want to gauge where these gentlemen with so much skin in the game, so many aspects that they're involved in advocating and supporting and so many jobs. But And as we do that, I would like for a special kind of commemoration. It's an artifact of the Azerbaijani incursion into the Artsakh Republic in 2020, which Ara kindly brought into Studio A. And it's a, there's a wooden standard with three candles that are burned at uh, for some minutes, each one of them. They're a little bit different lengths. Uh, they're yellow candles with the 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 blackened uh, wick. the wick at the top, and the commemorative plaque is. I will read to all audience members. Oh my goodness! There's some Armenian names: Asha Shamumian hmm. Province, <laughs> Davidank Monastery, Complex complex than the Kahatag Kashadakh Kashadakh province the Serb Hambardozum Hambardzum Hambardzum monastery Martakert location in Harappa province uh -huh. Gandas Hazar monastery complex those are the where apparently those tapers were burning in maybe any one of those different monasteries and houses of worship. These are samples of three candles from three monasteries in Artsakh, nagorno karabakh These are the last candles that were burned by pilgrims in the monasteries and were removed as the monasteries were being surrendered to the Azeris. Uh, one of them, Davidavank, is a first century monastery. It, it is named after Saint Thaddeus, an ap apostle who spread Christianity in Armenia, in Rarapach. Uh, the second one is a Kansasar, is a marvel of 12th century architecture uh, that has been uh, one of the most important worship centers in uh, Artsakh, Nagorno Rarapach, for millennia. They were surrendered after the 44 day war where Turkey and Azerbaijan together fought a war that was impossible to win and took over um, the lands that belong to Armenia. That was in 2020. Now all of nagorno karabakh is gone. It has been ethnically cleansed. There are no Armenians left in nagorno karabakh or as we call it Artsakh, where they had lived for centuries and built the monasteries of which now we have only half-lit candles left. And someone in that urgent and that crisis emergency setting, they had the presence of mind, this, these artifacts have to come out as a, a fact in the hand, a fact in the case, not in the ground. The gr facts in the ground are being decimated. A fact, a, an artifact that was is a reminder of the desperation and the the sweeping. I, I'm, I'm act an anthropologist about a different term besides ethnic cleansing because I can't handle the second word in that expression. It's so, so I, I'll be using genocide, but I'm not going to step on anybody's toes about terms that, we're, that people well, choose actually, to use. It's actually important to actually choose a proper term. I think a lot of people use ethnic cleansing because uh, it turns out to not be a legal term. It is a descriptive term, and as you point out, it's 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 offensive. Why is it why is it cleansing? Even it's elimination. It's destruction. Uh, genocide is a is a defined legal term, and it certainly applies to what we're seeing in Artsakh. And legal terms are what call in certain protocols to addressing the the transgressions that have occurred right. and the atrocities. So. I've had numbers of you and others, Vic Jarami included. He was uh, the most recent Armenian-American on this program. So I'm, we're not able to give the 
definitive and extensive background. If we're able to do a background since he was on here on September 5th, that's just right, Labor Day, the then uh, that was during the block the Lanchin blockade. And then uh, that's been that had been going on for about nine months. And then just shortly after he was on here was the September 19th attack on Artsakh that removed, removed Armenians who were either killed or fled as refugees. And so I would like for you to if there's other history, you would like to bring a listeners along where we are in that land today. Yes, so let me connect the dots, at least in terms of time. Azerbaijan had sur- surrounded s- late siege to nagorno karabakh the Armenian uh, enclave, and that has been a- in the territory of Azerbaijan for nine months. Um, they had starved the population entirely, cut off electricity, power, uh, communications, and food, and there were already people dying from starvation towards the end of the nine-month period. And then, on September 19th, they attacked, and the entire population, 120,000, are now refugees in Armenia who left Karabakh within two days. You may call that ethnic classic or the continuation of the Armenian genocide, as you wish. The facts of it were that we witnessed this. And the horrible part about it is that we knew it was coming. For nine months, the population was subject to starvation, and the entire purpose of it was to depopulate it from Armenians. There was no question about that. It was in, after almost nine month period, that It was recognized officially that what was going on, according to the Genocide Convention, corresponded to genocide where starvation was the means used. And this was uh, declared in a report that came out by Luis Ocampo, the first prosecutor of the International Court of um, Justice. And that was an alarm bell that went to our leadership in this country. Congressional hearings were held where he testified. He met with the State Department to tell them that there was genocide happening. And legally, according to the legal definition of the Genocide Convention, part of that convention is that if genocide can be prevented and is not, then there is complicity. So he was definitely accusing the U.S. State Department of non-involvement as being complicity in an act of genocide. That's tough to accept. And of course, what happened was that at the time he met with uh, Yuri Kim, who was at the time the acting Assistant Secretary of State of European Affairs, and she testified in front of the Senate Foreign Committee on September 14. Her closing remarks were, the U.S. will not countenance any action or effect, short-term or long-term, to ethnically cleanse or commit other atrocities against the Armenian population of nagorno karabakh This was on September 14. September 19, Azerbaijan attacked and depopulated nagorno karabakh So we knew it. It was coming. Our State Department had a very weak statement that they would not allow it. But of course, with complete impunity, Aliyev, the dictator of Azerbaijan, acted. And we had nothing to say about it. Interestingly enough, we had also ourselves, Kev and I, co-authored a letter to our chancellor to have him speak out before even then. So we had this letter sent to Chancellor Gilman on August 26. So 20 days before the final uh, attack on nagorno karabakh that depopulated the, the area. 
we had asked him that there is a humanitarian tragedy that can be prevented by our government and its allies were they to be implored by community leaders to heed the promise of never again. That platitude is stated almost always after the fact. In this case, there was an opportunity to speak out before it happened. Gilman's office sent us a letter about his policies on statements made by him. We never heard from him, and no statement was made on the genocide after it happened, during it happened, before it happened, where complicity is, silence is complicity is in our minds. Now it's Ara. Kev? Yeah, I, and you know, Ara gave the summary so well, yes. but I really wanted to also just highlight how much of a immense tragedy this is for all of humanity and Armenians in particular that both Ara and I were raised hearing about the stories of genocide in our grandparents and great grandparents time and now we sit in the United States of America the most powerful country in the world and are watching genocide unfold again to Armenians being driven out of their ancestral indigenous homelands and yet again with no power preventing it and what we're seeing is the international community's moral ethical failure to actually take genocide seriously and to act on it as one Armenian put it there's absolutely no integrity that matters in the international community except their definitions of territorial integrity. And because of that thing that the United Nations hide be hides behind, they're allowing genocide to occur in 2023. I want to also put in context that both the, the aggression in 2020 and in this recent last month, there is this very sinister kind of uh, of use exploitation of a world diverted with other catastrophes going on there there's no accident about those the timing of both of those ag aggressive moves by Azerbaijan so it's it, it's a it's a very pernicious kind of a, a sort of opportunity taking. I, want, I just want to put that. For those of you who've just joined us, my guests are Dr. Ara Apkarian, Distinguished Professor of Chemistry, and Dr. Kev Abizajian, Professor of Physics and Astronomy and Director of the Center for Cosmology at UCI. And we are talking about these two gentlemen as Armenian Americans, descendants of, of Armenians from the Republic of Armenia at different times about the aggression from Azerbaijan upon the Artsakh Republic, but that's not all. There's a, there's an additional corridor. I just want to quote a piece published yesterday in Politico that Secretary Anthony, U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, was concerned this latest offensive emptying out the Artsakh Republic and quoting that may not be the end of Azerbaijan's re regional ambitions, and all eyes are now on the Zen. Zangazur Corridor, a tract of land running along Armenia's border with Iran. The danger is that another move by Baku, that's the capital of Azerbaijan, that Baku's forces could inflame a broader conflict in the southern Caucasus, an area where Turkey, Russia, and Iran all have core strategic interests. End of the, the quote from that article, which is more of that, in, that territorial integrity that you're talking about. So you now Ara brought up the appeal to UCI Chancellor Howard Gilman in August 26th, and uh, I want to put up both his response to that and the, the combination of responses, I should say, and then UCLA Chancellor Gene Block's response. I now the actual numbers are very difficult. the The death toll of civilians and military and all. we uh, Those numbers are really hard to get from those ag the aggressions into 
Artsakh. So, I mean, we can argue that civilians had to become military because they're in a defensive position. So, I, so to say this number of, of war dead versus the number killed in, on October 7th, it's, it's a very difficult number to, uh, to post side by side. But I, I would like to say that Chancellor Gilman demurred on commenting at all when Ara and Kev and student, the Armenian Student Association appealed to him August 26th, but he did. He did respond October 10th, and I can, I'm not sure I should read all of it. The statement's available on the communications tab of the chancellor's website for UCI, uh, but he does respond at length about this horrific, as I'm quoting him, the horrific massacre of innocent individuals in Israel by Hamas. It's quite lengthy. It is all about the attack in, um, in Israel on October 7th. On October 9th, UCLA Chancellor Gene Block, I'm going to read his entire quote. It is much shorter, but in comparison to Chancellor Gilman's, Chancellor Gene Block's quote is, I write to share the below message from the University of California President Michael V. Drake and UC Board of Regents Chair Richard Lieb about the horrific and heart-wrenching terrorist attacks on Israeli citizens that took place over the weekend. These attacks led to an escalation of violence in the region that has since claimed many additional Israeli and Palestinian lives. I also wish to recognize, continues Chancellor Block, that this latest news adds to the other deeply concerning recent international events, including violence taking place against civilians in Artsakh, Nagorno-Karabakh. Attacks against innocent people anywhere are an injustice. That's the end of quote for UCLA Chancellor Jean Block. So I know the two of you have very particular responses to those juxtaposed public statements. Ara? Um, the public statement that was made by Gilman um, was disappointing in that he felt he had to make a statement about the fact that this was the greatest number of loss of human life to Jews since the Second World War. Just stopped at the fact that this was an injustice committed against Jews. While the subject of genocide is a humanitarian cause, completely neglecting one that he had an appeal to address, and then addressing another one because of the racial difference is something that sounds a bit hollow. There is a bit of a hypocrisy if my genocide is more important than your genocide. And the reason why these genocides keep happening is because of this attitude that never again is a hollow platitude stated after the fact. When the time and opportunity is there to act to prevent, if people do not act, then saying never again after the fact is just a platitude as far as I'm concerned that may satisfy the speaker, but really uh, sounds hollow to me. Right. Kev? Uh, uh, I agree with that. It's, it's, you shouldn't be selective in your outrage. There's um, a lot of atrocities to civilians going on globally. Uh, we don't hear about the Tigray genocide. We don't hear about um, the Armenian genocide enough. Uh, and what's going on in Israel and Palestine is getting a lot of attention. What's going on in the Ukraine is in Ukraine is getting a lot of attention. And they all should. It should be we should be outraged by the human rights atrocities going on everywhere. Um, and so to have this kind of, you know, to say something about one case but not, not the others is, is inappropriate and offensive. And it's also offensive to say if somebody says, you know, something's going on in Armenia and in Artsakh, to, also, to then say, you know, well... It's just too bad. There's just too much atrocity. There, nothing can be done. That is also not the right answer. The answer is our our responsibility as 
Americans as citizens is to have action that stops the the escalation of violence that we're seeing in 2023 globally. I just want to also mention Chancellor Gilman's background is in political science. So it's sort of like he should have some kind of academic tools to be able to b- better address all of this. There should be there should be something in his fluency as a, a political scientist. That's that's the part that can really stump me too. Political science and also um, from law school. So he understands the legalities or the humanitarian na- nature of the subject. Uh, but we should stand, stand on principle, not transactional details. The reason why uh, dictators like Aliyev are, have the impunity is because um, we, the, politically, the U.S. looks to the other side or Europe looks um, away, don't want to really uh, see what's going on because of transactions involving petrodollars, oil from um, Azerbaijan, and uh, the like. But as leaders of the community, uh, we should stand on principle. And any genocide, any atrocity, what's going on against the Palestinians today should be completely unaccepted. That's right. And I, I the what we're seeing unfold uh, in Artsakh is, is, is partly, you know, um, could be just the only the the beginning of of what's going on for Armenians in their ancestral homelands. The lack of condemnation, the lack of sanction, the lack of punitive action on a dictator who is on the scale of Saddam Hussein, uh, controlling an oil reserve, oppressing his own population, committing genocide, and without any action by any leadership almost that I see. Now, uh, we didn't hear anything from our chancellor on this. We have heard good things from our Orange County Board of Supervisors. We've heard good things from our federal representation, uh, Katie Porter and beyond, but so much more has to happen. Nothing punitive has happened. And this has actually emboldened this dictator to quite likely strike at the Republic of Armenia itself next and continue genocide. And if, if you think about what happened in 1915, this was not just a singular incident. It was an eight-year period of genocide, and we are raising alarm bells in the Armenian-American community that we are entering and have entered a new period of Armenian genocide, if not just the continuation of the last over century of genocide of Armenians. So anybody that doesn't, that sees the facts as I'm sure Chancellor Gilman has, and has not demanded the stopping of genocide is a moral failure and an ethical failure that I don't think we should be having at the University of California. Is there another appeal that you're preparing now? I don't mean to be getting uh, over, uh, stepping on uh, carefully timed uh, steps you're taking, but I, because now you have Chancellor Block's statement that compared to what uh, the, was the day before Chancellor Gilman's. But is yeah, there... Chancellor a, Blocks was better. It was, but, but, but it I mean, wasn't do you great. Ha- but, right, yeah. it, but by comparison. So I I don't know if there's another step or maybe there, you're contemplating in the the diaspora. Right, there's how, much can you, how many times can you ask somebody to do something? So I think we're, we're handling handing this off. Uh, other people, other Armenian Americans are outraged, including the Armenian Students Association, and they're currently working with the Associated Students of UCI, ASUCI, to pass a resolution condemning the lack of action and asking for for action from our University of California leadership. And actually, I think today is when, this afternoon, they will be considering this resolution. I I look forward to it being passed. In in fact, let me be clear that the letter was signed by about a dozen faculty members, Armenian Student Association, the Armenian Studies Center at UCI. So it involved more than the two of us in the appeal. And now indeed, uh, ASUCI is sponsoring a resolution which is going to address the subject. We hope it will pass. But but let me you know go back to 
Pylon's visit. Yes, that's where I was going to go next because I don't know if part of the, I called it a gesture because he has a lot to do while he's touring. He has to raise awareness. He has to raise funds. And so what his, I don't know if part of his visit was to put pressure on the leadership on this campus. So Turkish parliament, uh, he's now, his term ended this year at some time. And so among the themes that I heard him speaking about, which I believe you're going to bring up, are, is, uh, and I'll defer to you in most of them, but the themes I just want to put out there for listeners to start thinking about is the unity among all Armenians and levers that can be used to reestablish power amidst the aggression perpetrated by Azerbaijan and Turkey. So if you would both elaborate on those levers that he brought up, the beneficial relationship building in the Caucasus, and beyond the infrastructure that could serve the Caucasus, the tech, medical, and legal intelligentsia, the sectors there, the the need to diversify international relationships in that area, as uh, well as dealing with, in those kinds of uh, international relationships, capitalizing on the opportunists that Erdogan, the leader of Turkey, is. So he brought all, physically he's there to put pressure, and he's there to to band everyone to get on this unity uh, uh, bandwagon and be as effective and with the levers that he said are there because you need levers because power has to be asserted in this very asymmetric situation. Uh, so let me say that his primary message or the uh, reason why he was invited and is speaking is contained in the title of his talk. Uh, the title of his presentation was Armenian Rebirth, The Last Plight. And it was meant to sound the alarm that the invasion of Armenia proper is imminent if nothing is done. The Azeri side has definitely stated that they plan to take parts of Armenia proper. We're not talking about nagorno Garapa. In fact, they have occupied parts of Armenia proper, and there's not much that's being done. Now, the situation is complicated because Aliyev is not alone, but he is helped by Putin and Erdogan. All three of them have their eyes on opening up the corridor between Turkey and the Central Asian republics, what is the, called the Panturanist dream of Erdogan. Aliyev and Erdogan believe that they are two nation, two states but one nation, and they want to unite. And what's in the middle? Armenia. Putin, who has been the ally of Armenia all these years and protected its well-being, has basically sold Armenia now because Putin needs access to the Azeri pipelines to export its uh, gas and a sudden connection in order to compensate for the lost paths towards the West. So all three of these dictators are, have joined forces together, and it is clear as day that their intention is to take a big part of tiny Armenia, and that's imminent. So once again, we're sounding the alarm the question is, what leverage does Armenia have to have, let's say, the greater nations, in fact, come to rescue or to act to stop? Well, we don't have much of a leverage. Uh, Armenia proper is a tiny country. It's smaller than Los Angeles County. Its population is about 2 million people. And it doesn't have natural resources, petrol, or mining. It has culture to give, and one of its biggest assets that is the cause of Putin's anger is its democracy. It's the only democratic island in that part of the world, and Putin is threatened by that. So is Aliyev. And so that tiny country which has history, attributes, the first Christians, all of that are known facts, but not enough. In geopolitics, you need more leverage. You have to have something to sell. It's transactional. The only power that we think Armenia has is its brain power. 
and so it's a matter of using it. Also, it is assisted by the diaspora. So Kev and I are representatives of the diaspora, and, and there are many so of involved. Us. I mean, it's uh, every yeah. day you're thinking of what, not just levers, but uh, every single device. Literally, uh, there was a device when you last went to Armenia. You were taking devices with you, and there's there every moment of every breathing moment you're trying to figure out what is going to contribute to this. Exactly, and we again think this is completely preventable. That the war against Armenia that we think is imminent, and Blinken himself has stated that it is imminent, it can be prevented by probably one phone call from Biden to Erdogan. That would stop. Aliyev and Erdogan, uh, both or of them. It has to be Erdogan, you Erdogan said. Erdogan, for reason. As our NATO ally, presumably has to heed to um, Biden's phone call. Aliyev is, you know, a dictator who has his power strictly by its petro exports. And, and his power of being the the money, the uh, petrol launderer, money launderer from y y y Russia. Yes, but the impunity of after the statement made by the State Department that they would not allow Aliyev to enter nagorno karabakh a week later he did, and nothing happened. That's how we green light genocide. That's how we green light the atrocities around the world, and then post facto we try to put the pieces together. So Garo Pylon's visit was, and his message was that we are facing probably the termination of the Armenian state as it is now. And uh, to sound the alarm that the l one of the leverages that Armenia has is the community in the diaspora and that we should be united in the cause. At least bring up the story to public consciousness to ask our government to intervene. These are, and we have the numbers. I think there's, there's, uh, you know, the lower estimates of the Armenian diaspora within the United States are 500,000. I think that's actually probably four times bigger than that because uh, we don't actually have a census question on how many, if you're Armenian or not. Uh, something that we've been working on. Uh, so the uh, the uh, upper so you're doing are more your like own two survey. million. You're trying. Yeah, you're, you're reaching out within to every the Armenian wow. activist okay. community. It's it's upwards of two million people, and that is powerful. Those voices can instigate change from our elected leadership, and it's not too much to ask. We had no Armenian diaspora, very little of it, let's say, in 1915, 1918, and President Woodrow Wilson was deeply involved in protecting Armenia. He was instrumental in the founding of the first republic of armenia in 1918 and that republic was attacked by the turkish nationalist forces of ataturk who were uh, acting under that general's command to eliminate and destroy the republic the of armenia part yeah. and they did half of it was taken over by Turkish nationalist forces under c command of Ataturk, who is somehow still uh, allowed to be praised. The patron um, saint of the Disney uniform. actually was having a uh, 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 a praising uh, series of Ataturk, which was canceled appropriately because he is a genocidal leader. And they ha they did half eliminate the republic, the original Republic of Armenia, in 1918 through 1920. Uh, when the Bolsheviks stopped them from eliminating the rest. And Armenia has found itself, unfortunately, since that time, under the imperialistic uh, domination of Russian forces. And right now is trying to find its independent way and um, therefore is under threat. Yeah, let, let me just say one thing. You know, we may, uh, to a random um, listener, we may sound paranoid about genocide. But it's not paranoia. Just before the war, the 44-day war in 19, 2020, Erdogan declared in a speech that we are going to finish the task our grandfathers started. The task their grandfathers started was the genocide. And let me also remind those who know the uh, uh, origin of the word 
The word genocide was coined to describe the Turkish assault and um, uh, planned elimination of Armenians. It was first constructed to describe that. Now, there are new definitions post facto, uh, legal definitions that you know we understand why they happen, but that was the genocide of the 20th century, the first genocide of the 20th century. And usually we, we are not even spared that. So we think, as far as I am concerned, it is absolutely a continuation of what started in 1915 because they did not succeed. A sliver of Armenia survived. Now they think they are in the mindset of actually completing that job. And it's an imminent uh, issue. It can happen in the next few weeks. So we are concerned. And we hope that the world recognizes that this should be stopped because the principle, if it is not stopped, it will be done again and again. And it is happening again and again uh, as the law of the jungle dominates um, the world. So I, I would like to bring up, keep that thought for a second here, Kev. And so I was wondering what was going through your minds on October 7th with the attack uh, out of the Qassam Brigade inside of Israel, whether you thought this is another kind of catastrophe the world will focus on and there, this is going to be make more imminent the threat. On Armenia. Of course, it was a, a catastrophe and arguably genocidal intent uh, because Hamas's intent is the destruction of Israel and the people of Israel, and it should get attention. Uh, I would just say that it's not the only thing that should be getting people's attention, right? So uh, the asymmetrical warfare in Gaza now is uh, should also get attention. Uh, what's going on in, in Ethiopia should be getting attention with the Tigrayans. Uh, People, there's not enough uh, action on our in our leadership globally, our own national leadership, and internationally to do what the United Nations was meant to do, which is stop genocide. It was formed in the wake of the worst genocide in history to prevent genocide, and it's absolutely failing in that mission. Impotent. Yes. Uh, you know, indeed, the um, what's going on in Israel and Palestine today is distracting from the fact that there's another genocide happening in the other side. But it's they're both as important as significant, and they're both due to the negligence of the world in having responses, peaceful responses to conflicts, as opposed to militaristic. There's too much military. Uh, solutions being implemented to problems that are deeper, much more serious, require um, sitting down and creating a coexistence between people who would have otherwise done so. Right? So there are similarities in all of this warmongering, and there is nothing good that can come out of killing, bombing um, as a solution to a dispute. Just to let folks know who just may have tuned in, my guests for this full hour are Dr. Ara Abkarian and Dr. Kev Abizaji. They're both actually physical science academicians here at UC Irvine. They are both part of the Armenian diaspora, and they both are here in Irvine. And they are both in Studio A live with me today, which is such a huge, huge honor for me. So I want to call out there's complexities in this unity. I observed at last Monday's talk that Garo Palan brought that there there was different reactions and I and so your your tasks are really unwieldy or defending Armenia's existence and having the diaspora all fall in on the same unity train there. So I, do you want to say anything about that, or would you particularly like to raise something more, something else? Uh, perhaps I should say a few words about Garo Pailan himself. Yes, please. Uh, Garo Pailan is an Armenian. His grandparents were the survivors of the, 
of the Turkish genocide, but he grew up in Turkey and he was twice elected a member of the parliament of Turkey. Very few Armenians in that role ever. But he is also the founding member of the People's Democratic Party, a progressive party, the, the progressive party in Turkey that is dedicated to human rights and minority rights. And he's raised his voice about minorities, including the genocide within Turkey, with an aim of creating a reconciliation between Turks and Armenians in Turkey about the subject of genocide. He's had the courage, in fact, the only person in parliament to stand up on the day of commemoration of the Armenian genocide and mention the names of the leaders of the Armenian community who were killed on April 24th as the beginning salvo of uh, executing the plan to exterminate all Armenians. He named them all. What At happened first, in that? Do you, do you have a, is there a, a telling of what happened inside that chamber? Yes, he was attacked, he was bitten, he was called names and uh, slandered. He, there are two at least um, documented cases of attempts of assassination against his life that were foiled. The last one in 2022. So he's been a marked person in um, Turkey. Nevertheless, he's always spoken out. And um, his dedication to the civil service for the Turkish community and the minorities. So he's spoken out at the Jewish minority, the Kurdish groups in Turkey, as that there should be a progressive solution to the minorities being able to live together as they had done for millennia before. But the present government of Turkey, Erdogan, is uh, a panturanist dedicated to the grandeur of uh, uh, Turkishness. In fact, people are jailed in Turkey for insulting Turkishness. Or so Garo Pailan has dedicated his life. In I, I should also say that he's been nominated twice for the Nobel Peace Prize and is likely to get it because of what he's done, his, what, what he's accomplished for the Turkish population. So he knows genocide. He knows the history. He's lived in Turkey. He knows from inside that indeed the ultimatum given to Armenia is meant so. So, as a person who understands this society, sounding the alarm should be taken seriously. Alarm. Yeah. Uppercase letters. Every letter. Right. He feels, as many of us who are paying attention to what's happening on the ground and what's happening by the stated in, in genocidal intentions of Azerbaijani leadership and Turkish leadership, that Armenia is under existential threat. And under that condition, he's calling for unity. And that's very understandable. And I think it takes that to, to move forward, to try to stop what unfortunately could be unfolding. So for this kind of a, a massively important, urgent alarm to, uh, ringing, what about the audience that was there? I was sweeping, I was there purely by accident. So I don't know if there was a, a, a charter to get, to fill a, a larger room. I don't know what was, what was the ideal arrangement for whom to reach on last Monday when he was here to speak? Yeah, unfortunately, the audience was mostly Armenians, and that really is singing to the choir. Um, and nevertheless, it's necessary to mobilize the diaspora about the cause and to explain something that is uh, also pretty tricky to understand. Armenia is not in a position to fight any war. Armenia is not interested in fighting. So all of the attempts that's happening with, the, with our prime minister in Armenia is attempts to sign a peace treaty, which is failing and failing because the other side is not really interested in peace. Attempts 
at signing peace, part of it would be giving up land. And that usually is unwelcome for a tiny country with a tiny population that feels quite impotent about life. So the U united front is a front to find ways to implement peace. And that is actually Pylon's um, uh, uh, the target appeal, goal. target to the community, that we need peace, but we have to find a way of reaching that. And as you mentioned, we have very few levers to use to impose peace in that part of the world. Yeah, and I, I, it's it's important to note that October 5th, actually, there was going to be a meeting between the Prime Minister of Armenia and Aliyev, the dictator of Azerbaijan, and Aliyev pulled out. Uh, it was meant to be a uh, mediated meeting to work on this peace agreement. And Aliyev pulled out, and, I, and it is certainly not an accident because conflict is what keeps dictators in place because the, the dictator of Aliyev can always point to Armenia as being the hostile actor as who we need to fight because our our problems at home are because of Armenia and Armenians. And as soon as that problem goes away with the peace treaty, his raison d'etre, his purpose is then, what is it? And then the, He's no longer our nationalistic leader. People will start asking, well, well and where's we our oil poverty? revenue? Where, why where's do we live it in being poverty? Shared? Yeah. Where is our rights to speech? Where are these things? And Aliyev would be under threat. Uh, so dictators thrive on conflict, and uh, that's why we need to force a peace. So closing both of you, just as we have to draw down, it's on you. I'm demurring. Um, the, the subject is um, uh, complex. Uh, it requires analysis, but I'd like to close by saying yes. that the Armenian community at UCI students, faculty, all are community affected. Members. All community members are affected deeply with what goes on. It's a minority that should not be neglected just because of their numbers. Thank you. And yes, if you know an Armenian American, reach out to them, ask them how they're doing because quite likely they're not doing well. And if you want to support the Armenian American community, work through our activist organizations. The ANCA is a great one. The Armenian Assembly is a great one. Google both of those. If you want to take action to get our federal representation to do something, go to anca.org slash alert, anca.org slash alert, and you can write your elected representation to take action on this matter. Reach out to Armenian organizations in your local community and see how you can help. I'll put those very links in the podcast summary so people can refer those so go to askaleader.com to find that thank, thank you claudia thank you both ara and kev for your time this is so important even as really hard as this subject is we must do these we must cover this thank you very much for your time thanks for coming to the studio thank you, thank claudia. you. my guests were dr ara abkarian Distinguished Professor of Chemistry and Dr. Kev Abizajian, Professor of Physics, Astronomy, and Director of the Center for Cosmology at UCI, members of the Armenian Diaspora. That's my wrap. Next week, my guest will be Brian Cunningham, UCI Law Professor, Executive Director of UCI's Cybersecurity Policy and Research Institute and vigorous Twitter space contributor. It'll be a pretty definitive coverage of disinfo, misinfo, and malinformation. App material for Halloween. Huh? Talk with you next week. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Mm -hmm.